So hello guys and welcome back to the Equals of Palace TV channel. Now obviously we haven't made a signing today which I said that I, when we do make a signing I'd normally do a live stream. But actually what I'm going to do today is just go over a few things that have happened in the recent days. So obviously I've done my last live stream on Tuesday night. And obviously I'm going to do a new one here just to update you with a few things obviously Palace related. So in terms of what I'm going to be discussing over the next sort of half an hour to an hour. Depending on obviously how many people I get and the questions you give going to be discussing the new squad numbers obviously for the two new signings uh, there's been a few outgoing transfers so I'll just discuss them in a little bit of detail and obviously the Guaita saga obviously just discussing what the latest is there and obviously whether we will actually get Guaita or whether the deal will be dead and we'll have to wait until the summer to sign him but in terms of starting in terms yeah in terms of starting on the numbers so Ido Rakip as you can see on the screen there has been given the number 31 shirt so like I've said, quite a lot of you were asking me questions during the last live stream as to what numbers each players would get. Well, here you go. It's been announced uh, Rakip will get the number 31, which I thought I didn't think he would get. It's Jeffrey Slup's old number, but fair enough. He's on loan, so he doesn't necessarily have to get a good number at the moment. And obviously the second signing, Yak, Yagoslav Yak, he's been given the number 33 shirt. Personally for me, obviously because there's so many numbers between is it 14, uh, 14, I believe, the... The, what, the, foot, the lowest one is that's available and I believe obviously 42 is the highest with punching so actually it's pretty hard to pick numbers in between that but actually uh, you know I didn't predict here we get the, get the 33 but I think that's fine and to be honest yes they're boring numbers but if you look back at the, the numbers that are still available you've got the likes of number 9 which would possibly be a striker and obviously number 16 as well Dwight Gale's old number so there's two you know places really that could be reserved for potential striker over the next few weeks so do comment below what you think about the numbers and whether you do think that actually if for example yak will be a success whether you do think you might get him on the back of your shirt because much like lutum has made himself into a cult hero over the last few months maybe yak could do the same but like i've said here so obviously yagosov lack uh, the polish international has got the number 33 and ida rakip has got the number 31 now in terms of some outgoing transfers, just to go over obviously what's happened over the last few days. So the first one is Sully Kaikai who today has joined Cholton on loan. So just to read through the club statement in terms of uh, w what this is. So obviously he's joined League One side Cholton Athletic on a loan until the end of the season. So obviously he had come back in the summer. The 22 year old spent half of last season on loan at Brentford making 18 appearances and scoring three goals. And after an impressive loan period at Shrewsbury Town in 2015-16, which saw him top their scorer's chart with 12 goals in 29 appearances. So basically, although he hasn't really been given a chance here at Palace, actually when he's played in League 1, League 2, actually he's been quite successful. So as much as it pains me to say it, actually it could be a good signing for Cholton coming up. And obviously that form saw the Palace Academy project make his Premier League debut in the final game of the season against Southampton in May 2016. His second senior appearance for the Eagles was uh, after scoring against Newcastle United in a League Cup tie in September 2014. So I don't know if you, you guys remember that game at Sellers Park, but it was a, I think it was a 3-3 draw, I believe it was, or we won it 3-2, whatever it was. Obviously, Soli Kai Kai came off the bench for his second debut and actually obviously scored that goal, which was quite significant in terms of the game. And obviously, um, Neil Warnock, I believe, was in charge at the time. Kai Kai has made four further appearances for the club this season in all competitions, taking that total up to nine. He's also been at loan at Crawley Town and Cranebridge United during his time at Sellers Park. So obviously, once again, got that experience from different leagues. And obviously, he now aims to help Carl Robertson's team return to the second tier with the Addicts currently sitting in, an, in seventh place in League One. So obviously, he's coming into the uh, Cholton side. Yes, they're, they're our rivals, but they're trying to get promoted to the Championship and certainly for me, the you know the attacking prowess that Kai Kai's got, I do think he can have a big influence for them. So good luck to Kai Kai. I hope it's a success for you. And hopefully, if you do perform well uh, for Cholton, and let's say you get them promoted, hopefully you can come back to Palace and obviously once again uh, get a chance to get back into the first team. Now, in terms of another outgoing, another academy player, obviously maybe not all of you, if you don't follow the academy football, might not know about, but. Andre Coco has obviously joined Maidstone United on loan and much like Kai Kai's loan it is till the end of the season. So he's one of these players who's been performing really, really well in terms of the under 23 games. And now just giving him a chance in league football, 
uh, with Maidstone will hopefully hopefully aid his development even further. And obviously this will be the first taste of football away from Palace during his four month stay at the Gallagher Stadium. Obviously four months being till the end of the season where he featured for the Eagles in a pre-season friendly back in July last year. So under Frank De Boer, obviously we played Maidstone United and actually Coco had quite a good game there. Now Coco is 26, uh, sorry he's 20 years old and he's been at the club since 13 years old. As well as playing on the wing, he is obviously able to play up front, which will help the Stones as they aim to improve their current position of 14th in the National League. So although he's obviously not playing in the league period, he's playing uh, for the na in the National League, it's still going to give him a bit more experience. And certainly for a 20-year-old who hasn't really played any competitive football other than any under-23 game, obviously having this chance to play in a league for Maidstone United will actually be quite good for his development. So do comment below what you think about Kai Kai and his loan, and also what you think of Andre Co uh, Coker's um, loan deal as well. Because personally for me, I think they're both good. They've got good potential, but whether they will be able to actually come back to Palace and actually have any influence, uh, that's to be seen. But for me personally, I think Sully Kai Kai is still going to develop a bit more. And when you consider he's 22 years old now, it, you know this is going to be the brink for him. If he doesn't succeed at Cholton, he'll probably leave Palace permanently in the summer. But if he does do well, he may get he may stay for, uh, with us for another few seasons. And then Coker is 20 years old, so he's still relatively young. So we can't really judge um, too much on him at the moment. Now, obviously, I've seen that you're sending in quite a lot of questions. But before I go on to read them, I'm just going to go over the Guaita deal. And obviously, uh, what the latest is there regarding his move to Palace or his not, not move to Palace. You know, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but ju just to go over it, obviously, in a few details, if you don't know uh, it in detail already. But Sky Sports reported that he actually passed his Palace medical on Wednesday. Obviously, he came over on his day off um, from Getafe and obviously had a medical for Palace, which he's well in his right to do. You know, he's not breaching his contract in terms of uh, leaving to another club purely because it's a pre-contract deal. So because his contract is up at the end of the season, he's able to talk to other clubs and have medicals. That's fine. And obviously he's passed that medical, which means that he will join Palace in the summer for free. So we won't have to pay anything other than his wages. And obviously that will be uh, on a pre-contract. So although um, we're obviously looking to get him uh, on a perm, or we're looking to get him now in the January transfer window, we've actually agreed a deal to get him in the summer. So even if we don't get him in January, which I personally would be quite disappointed with, at least we've still got a goalkeeper sorted uh, for the beginning of next season. But obviously Sky Sports, you know, we don't know. Uh, you know how good and how reliable their sources are but they said that he could join in January for 3.5 million pounds as that's his unofficial buyout clause so obviously there's a lot of confusion over this but in the Liga there's you have to have an official buyout clause in everyone's contract and for Guaita that is I believe it's 8 million euros but he had an agreement with the chairman that if an offer came of more than 4 million pounds or 4 million euros then they would have to sell him and obviously Palace have put in a bit of that which is equivalent to 3.5 million pounds so Palace realistically legally can actually sign Guaita um, in in this window purely because we paid his buyout clause albeit the the personal one rather than the official one but the fact that we paid that means we're actually able to get him in the you know the January window and obviously uh, Getafe have come out and said they don't want to sell him they don't want to get rid of him in this window but obviously Palace the fact that we keep haggling on with this the fact that we've been linked with numerous other keepers surely sort of suggests that actually we are looking to get the Guaita deal done and you know I know Sky Sports are not the most reliable but they said that the negotiations are ongoing and personally for me I think if it gets the deadline day and you know Getafe have to make a decision do they want him to leave for free in the summer or do they want to cash in and get four million euros now as opposed to losing him for free in the summer I think when it comes to deadline day, because the deal is already in place in terms of his medical, I think Getafe might just, you know, give him, uh, give him and end up giving us Guaita um, in this window for about £3.5 million. And obviously, like I've said already, um, Getafe, the chairman, the manager have all come out and said that they don't want to sell him in this window. But like I've already mentioned, do they want to risk losing him for free instead of losing him for about £3.5 to £8 million? So would they rather get a little bit of money for him as opposed to losing him for free so that's something that they've got to decide and that's something that obviously is going to be is going to really hinge on Palace so if Getafe don't want to sell him then we're going to either have to look elsewhere 
to get a goalkeeper this window or we've got to actually you know pay up the money and actually persuade Getafe to obviously give him to us now so what I'm going to do now is obviously now I've just given you a brief explanation I've got the Spanish uh, football expert Garim um, Bagale I believe it's how you say it um, he's you know he's got all the details about the Getafe deal and he's obviously put a video up on YouTube so what I'm going to do just bring that video up here and obviously it just gives you a little bit more detail in terms of the Getafe deal because I'm not the expert and obviously he just goes through some of the details regarding it and obviously you know in a little bit more detail in comparison to uh, you know the, the knowledge I have so I'll just give you uh, the interview now The improvement on the philosophy of La Masia. Anyway, I wanted to tell you about Guaita because it's an interesting situation. So Guaita has passed a medical with Crystal Palace. Uh, that is for him to sign at the end of the season. Nothing illegal about it. Uh, he finishes his contract at the end of the season and uh, he has agreed to join Crystal Palace next season. But of course, Getafe knows about it and now they have a decision to make. Would they let him go for free at the end of the season or would they let him go for 4 million euros? Uh, Getafe stay with the idea that uh, his bio clause is 8 million euros, which is the contract that was sent to the league. But after that contract was signed, just after it, uh, there was a private contract between the club and uh, Waita in which he could go for 4 million euros. If Getafe accepts 4 million euros now, well, he could go now. But otherwise, he'll be uh, at Crystal Palace next season. Waita is, um, is a top goalkeeper. Uh, I remember when he was at Valencia, uh, the goalkeeper coach was the same goalkeeper coach that the national side, uh, Goiko Echea. Oh, no. Ocho Torrena. There's a reason why I thought of Goiko Echea. Uh, he's a former Dream Team player, which I'm trying to um, get hold of for a Dream Team documentary that we're doing also for Sky Sports. Forget it. Ocho Torrena. Uh, he actually told me that uh, he was good enough to be a regular with the national side, but um, the problems at Valencia affected him. Eventually he left. Uh, it's only in the last couple of years that we, he's reached his, his level. Uh, around the 30 year mark is when goalkeepers tend to be at their best. He certainly is at the moment. Strong, tall, good in the air, uh, good personality, calm, and a lot of things that will work really well with the Premier League. As always, uh, goalkeepers, um, goalkeepers and centre-backs, I would say, that come from La Liga tend to take a while to um, adapt to the Premier League, the pace of it and the strength of, the strength of it. And the referees, because they tend to um, have different kind of rules to the rest of the world, uh, which is what makes the Premier League exciting, exciting, of course. But that affects goalkeepers who have got a little bit, bit less protection than they do have in Spain. So he'll have to adapt to that. I'm sure he will. Uh, he's just had a baby. I think he's got a couple of uh, young kids. So uh, I'm, it'd be interesting to see if the family comes with him or, or they stay behind while he settles in London. So all that is for later. But for now, Getafe will have to soon make a, a decision. Do they let him go now? But not for 8 million as they're asking, but 4 million or do they let him go at the end of the season because he's definitely leaving he's got a free contract with crystal palace and as i said he's passed the medical already so that's the situation with guy white we'll keep an eye on it and now i'm going to see mascherano saying goodbye cheers so there you have it there was just a little bit more of a detailed insight into this um quite a deal and obviously it just gives you a sort of an idea of how complicated the deal is and the fact that Getafe don't want to sell they've got to buy out clauses and the fact that Palace have paid one of them not going to apply or not going to um, listen to the other one and just want to pay the unofficial one which is 3.5 million pounds so it is a quite um quite a complicated deal and hopefully for me having seen how good Guaita is and having listened to you know what Spanish fans thinks of it think of him I actually think he could be a really good signing for Palace because clearly Based on what I've seen and based on the stats, he actually looks like a really decent keeper. So really for me, you know, yes, Hennessy and Sproni are all right. But, you know, they're quite inconsistent. Whereas, you know, Guaita has actually showed that he's actually 
in a good quality he is obviously of a good quality and much like what you've heard in the video there he's obviously you know he is top class and could be at least you know a few years ago could have been you know in that spanish squad purely because of how good he's been but i've just got another one here obviously this is a more up-to-date um insight into the the Guaita situation obviously this was posted the other day so just gives you a more um i suppose up-to-date view because the other video was posted a few days ago this one's just giving you a little bit more of an updated insight into the current situation with Guaita. Um, we got over there, Mr. Rich, Laporte, ah, Waita. That's an interesting one. So he's past the medical, as we said er, uh, earlier. Not for Palace to sign him right now, but uh, as part of a pre-contract for next season. Okay, so uh, Waita has got a pre-contract with uh, Crystal Palace for next season. But Getafe could actually get nothing for the player. If they let him go at the end of the season, the thing is, if they let him go now, because of uh, uh, Crystal Palace will pay the four million euros of the uh, that the price. Contract between that Waiter and Getafe signed. Uh, four million euros is all that Crystal Palace will pay. And legally, that's all what they have to pay. The problem is, out of those four million, Hedafe only gets one million. So the decision that Hedafe has to do is: do we let him go now uh, and get that million, or do we just uh, keep him, lose that million, but at, at least have a, a, a top uh, goalkeeper until the end of the season? So that's where the situation is at the moment. So I think we're gonna leave it there. If I hear any more. So there you have it, there was just another more detailed, more up-to-date insight into the Guaita transfer. Obviously, like I've said already, it is a quite a difficult transfer in terms of the two different buyout clauses. But obviously Palace look like they're quite confident in getting the deal done. And hopefully Roy Hodgson, Steve Harris, Doggy Freeman, hopefully they can obviously work together to uh, get the deal done. Because personally for me, like I've already said, I think it's a really, really, um, it would be a really, really good signing for Palace. So do comment below uh, what you think uh, about the deal and I just just saw a comment about what time does the window shut. I did realise that I didn't actually put the timer on at the beginning of the stream but now I've updated it so you should see in the top um, top corner at the top of the page the, the timer should be there now. So just to give you an idea of how long there is left in the transfer window so there's only five days now so it is getting quite tight in terms of getting transfers in but the fact that we've now got two transfers and we've got this deal almost lined up we've got other deals uh, line up uh, lined up it looks like that actually maybe something might be close to happening so do comment below uh, what you think about the coming about the coming days obviously whether you do think any more signings will come
Okay, I'm sorry, I did have a problem with my mic, but I'm talking back again. Obviously, what I was just doing was just going through some of the pictures, just talking, uh, you know, talking about my lineup, my predicted lineup, and because the sand was off, I'll just go, uh, go through it again. But um, in terms of this picture, before I go back, obviously Papa Shire, as I was saying, he's playing in a develop, he's played a few development games, now moved on to the bench, and if we are comfortably winning against West Ham, I don't see any problem why he couldn't come off the bench. And obviously James Tonkin's there. I think we'll start in the centre-back role. Obviously, Jara Reedwald here against Wilf. I think Wilf will definitely start against West Ham. Obviously, he had quite a long rest. So, although he's been tied in recent games, I think he'll be up for the game against West Ham. And then Reedwald is an interesting one. If MacArthur isn't fit enough to play or there's a tactical change, I think that Reedwald could come in for MacArthur potentially. But I personally think because MacArthur is slightly more versatile than Reedwald, I think that MacArthur is the one who's most likely to start. Obviously, once again there, MacArthur there, Tim Fossumensa. I think Fossumensa will start at right back, right back in the game. Roy Hodgson again there. Obviously, Joe Ward here is now back in full training. Obviously, was on the bench uh, last weekend. I personally think for him, it'll be a few more weeks until he's fully fit to start. And also, I think because Fossumensa is playing quite well uh, recently, I don't see any reason why um, Joe Ward should be dropped. Um, just to go through some other pictures here. Obviously, another one here of Yak. Obviously, that doesn't really show you much, but it shows you that he's settling into training. And then another one here, obviously, you know, showing that Townsend's now back. So Townsend could potentially play uh, against West Ham, which would be a great addition. And obviously, Luca and Saka once again returning to the side. But obviously, like I've said here, I did obviously have the sound off. Obviously, there was a glitch with the system. So just to go through some of the pictures again, obviously, which gives you an idea of what the potential lineup could be uh, against West Ham. So obviously, in this picture here, you've got Kaiko, who's now obviously gone to Charlton on loan. You've got Martin Kelly, James Tonkins, Luke Milvojevic, Benteke. So for me, I think Martin Kelly, James Tonkins, they start for me at centre-back uh, against West Ham. Obviously, Luca starts in that defensive midfield role and for me will keep the captaincy. And then Benteke, although people criticise him, I think it's almost guaranteed that he will start this game. And do comment below if you are watching. Do comment below with uh, your thoughts on the lineup and what you think the result will be uh, against West Ham. So just to go through some other ones again, obviously Roy Hodgson there. Papa Suarez, I've already discussed the fact that he's obviously come back into the side. Um, he's been playing on the bench and if we are winning the game, maybe he might come off. But I think we won't, won't wish, risk it and I think he's still a couple months away from actually potentially you know, starting back up, up in the side again. Obviously Benteke there again with Luca. I think that you know it's quite obvious that Benteke will start. I don't think we'll stop even though he hasn't scored recently. I don't think we're we're drop him because he's such a presence up front. And although he hasn't scored, he's still got loads of assists recently, and actually is still being that presence with his hold up play. Obviously here Townsend, it's you know a miraculous recovery he's made from his injury. So I don't think he'll start considering the fact that he still needs to, needs to get match fit. But I think he'd be a great um, impact sub off the bench. And obviously Wilf, it's guaranteed that he will start the game. Obviously our new signing Erdo Rakip. Obviously, I, I, when this when my volume was off, I was talking about the fact that the training video that the club released, you could see the quality that Rakip had on the ball, not only in terms of his shooting, but also his passing. And obviously, this picture here just demonstrates that there. Obviously, Patrick Van Aanholt as well will start at left back for me. You know, I think Papa Suare, like I've said, is still uh, quite far off. And obviously, um, uh, Jeffrey Slop's out injured. So for me, Patrick Van Aanholt starts at left back. And when you consider how good he's been, uh, offensively recently I think he'd be quite an important player in terms of attacking West Ham obviously here um, Jagoslav uh, Yak obviously the new signing obviously recently been given the number 33 uh, on the shirt but personally for me I don't think he'd be thrown in at the deep end I think that like I've said Kelly and Tompkins will start the game at centre back but I still think that there'll be a picture later on about Sacco but I think that the fact that Sacco is now coming back he can obviously not only obviously help Jack to settle in and obviously settle into the Premier League and the club but also he can teach him how to adapt to the Premier League and hopefully the fact that Sacco's played in numerous leagues and obviously Yak has only he's only played in the Polish League and has come to the English League hopefully that experience Sacco or that Sacco brings will obviously help Yak settle in and I personally think obviously because we haven't got FA Cup games to test players in it's not ideal but I still think Yak maybe towards the end of the season when we're guaranteed safety maybe he'll get a few starts and like I've said alongside Sacco I think he'll learn quite a lot obviously here's just you know, you know your normal team uh, meeting 
Mamadou Saka, who, like I've said, it's, it's fantastic that he's now back. And we thought, I thought personally, that he'd be back the end of February. It's obviously great to see him back in training now. And although he's probably maybe two, three weeks away from being fully, fully match fit, I still think that actually he could be fit for the Newcastle game uh, at the begin beginning of February. So although that's only uh, a week away or so, I still think that maybe if he does well in training, he could potentially play there. But I think the fact that Kelly and um, Dan have been playing um, so much recently, so well together recently, I don't see any reason why they should be dropped. Obviously, Bakary Saka here, the man at the moment. I think that he'll start up front with Christian Menteke in this game here because I think that recently uh, Saka has obviously been playing really well. He's got loads of important goals uh, for us. And I personally think that Saka, you know, although it's not ideal him playing up front, I think he before has a good partnership with Benteke. Once again, Papa Suare there will probably be on the bench with Tompkins starting. Reedward here is an interesting one. I think that if we're going to change our system and drop someone like MacArthur, I think Reedward would come in. But if we're going to play MacArthur out wide, which isn't ideal, but because he's adaptable, adaptable, he can play there. If we are going to do that, then of course, I think that he stays in that position. But if we don't and we play more central, then I don't. I think Reedward would be a better option purely because he's got that little bit better of a passing ability and sort of being able to hold up possession that he's much better at. Obviously, once again, MacArthur mentioned there, I think he could start as he could start or Reedward would start. So it's either one of them two. And obviously, Fossi Mensah as well, he will start He will start at right back. Obviously, I've got a comment here, the sound has gone again, I'll refresh. Yeah, I think there shouldn't be a problem according to my software. Uh, the sound should be working, so I don't see any reason why there should be problems. But do comment if the sound does go on the stream. So just to go through the final few pictures here, obviously Roy Hodgson there, not really much to look into there. Obviously Sully Kaiko there, who's obviously now gone on loan to Charlton, but Joe Ward as well. Um, I think Joe Ward, although he's obviously still getting back to match fitness, I think he'll probably be on the bench against, against West Ham. And it'll probably be two or three weeks because of how long he's been out. It'll be two or three weeks before he's, you know, he could be, you know, on the on the edges or on the brink of getting in the first team. But because Fossey Mentz has been playing quite well recently, I think that Joe Ward shouldn't be guaranteed a place straight away back in the squad purely because he has to earn it because of how well uh, Fossey Mentz has been playing re recently. Obviously, another one there of Yagoslav Yak. I think that, you know, like I've said already, I don't think he'd be thrown in at the deep end. And obviously, the final one here of Andros Townsend, like I've said already, fantastic recovery from his injury and hopefully he can bring us some sort of impact off the bench. So I've seen a few comments here, obviously, about transfers and, you know, obviously about, you know, who we think we should bring in, obviously, who you're concerned about, how many players you think we should bring in. And I've seen a few suggestions as well. Obviously, this was the screen I was talking about. You obviously, if you've listened and watched the other streams, you would have seen it. But basically, this is sort of like Sky Sports News. It shows your, in, your ins, your outs, and obviously the latest. So in terms of your ins, we've like I've said already, the two live streams are done at the beginning of the week. Erda Rakip from uh, Benfica on loan. Jagoslav Yak uh, from Lubin, uh, 3 million euros. Obviously, the outs, so there's been a few more additions to this. Um, but Keshi Anderson to Swindon Town, undisclosed. Noor Hussin, who I didn't add on the other stream, but I forgot to put him on there. But he's joined Notts County for an undisclosed fee. Obviously, Andre Coco, as I said already, he's joined Mainstone, Maidstone United on loan. And obviously, Sully Kaika as well has also joined Charlton Athletic on loan. So they're just the ins and outs so far. Obviously, there's no, there hasn't been any massive ins in terms of big money signings, i.e. someone like Ibrahim Amadou or Guaita or someone like Moussa Dembele. There's been no major ins and there's also been no major outs because they're two sort of minimal fees for Keshi Anderson and Hussein and also they're both loan fees for Koka and Kaiko. So there's been no major, you know, outgoings there. But in terms of the latest news, I don't know, once again, this is from Sky Sports, so it's not necessarily the most reliable. But we've had a new improved bid for Ibrahim Hamadou turned down by Lille. So the first bid we put in, the initial bid was about £16 million, I believe it was. And that was rejected three weeks ago. And apparently the new bid was higher than that. Obviously, I believe it was... I, I'm, I haven't seen the exact figures, but I'm guessing, based on reports, it was probably about £16 million. Uh, pounds. And obviously, Lille have rejected that. But if you don't know... 
Lille are in some financial pro problems. They obviously, I think they've put in some dodgy paperwork to the uh, Football Association. So because of that, um, they have to pay back all this money. Otherwise, they get automatic uh, relegation. And because of that, they have to they have to raise about 20 million euros, which if they if Palace pay about 20 million pounds or euros thereabouts, that would cover that cost by buying Amadou. And obviously that would not only sort Palace out in terms of bringing in a quality young 24 year old defender slash uh, defensive midfielder, but also it would ensure that um, Lille wouldn't get that automatic relegation. And like what I've mentioned earlier with Guaita, obviously he's passed his pa Palace medical, so he's scheduled to join in the summer. But there's still, you know, talks and negotiations in, and in terms of whether he will join for free in the summer, so we don't pay a penny, or whether Guaita, um, sorry, or whether Getafe want to cash in and we pay their 3.5 million release clause and we get him in now in this window, which will be better for us. But also it would give, you know, Getafe some more money as opposed to losing him for free completely. So do comment below what you think about these and whether you do think there's any other transfers I've missed. But there's one, you know, there's rumours about Moussa Dembele in terms of a bid being put in and, you know, he may be distracted. But Brendan Rodgers has said that you need to be serious with the bids, but he's happy here. So there's been loads of contrasting reports. But I personally think that um, if we're going to look at a striker, it's got to be um, Barbacar, who we've already been in talks with. Or you've got to look at Moussa Dembele, who's a quality 21-year-old Frenchman. Um, you know, he done all right in the championship, albeit at a lower level. He's gone to the Scottish League, which is, yes, not the best league in terms of quality. But the fact that he banged in loads of goals there and scored against Barcelona in the Champions League shows that he's got a little bit of quality there. So do comment below what you think about him and obviously which striker you think we do buy, do need to buy and whether you do think that we should buy Ibrahim Amadou in terms of both defensive and midfield cover and whether you do think we'll end up signing um, uh, signing uh, Gaitan from Getafe. So I'm just reading through some of your comments here. Obviously, Danny Boy, O South London, thank you for tuning in again. Obviously, you were with me with the last two streams. But in terms of some of your questions, is there a buyout cause for Rakip? Uh, yes, there is. I believe it's £10 million. So if Palace do decide they want to buy him in the summer, it'd be a £10 million fee. And although Benfica got him for free and obviously Palace missed out on getting him for free, I still think that, yes, we missed out on that. But in the Premier League, £10 million for a player who could potentially have quality and be quite a good prospect at about 22 years old he'll probably be at the time I think that that would be a good deal so even though we could have got him for free obviously it's it's not the end of the world if we have to pay 10 million pound uh, he's also said that I'm pretty underwhelmed by the lack of strikers yep so am I obviously we've still only got Benteke and realistically can we really class Sako as a striker not really so personally for me you said Barbacar yep Barbacar for me I think he's 24 he's 24 years old got a good got a good bit of pedigree about him he scored quite a lot of goals got quite a few assists and in terms of being that physical presence and having pace he's slightly different in terms of his style to Benteke which actually if we play a 4-4-2 having two players who are slightly different that can actually work quite well in terms of complementing each other who'd like another winger I think that yes if we're going to bring in three players let's say we're going to bring in three it'll be a goalkeeper in um, 
Guaita, it will be, um, you know, it will be a striker in Dembele or maybe Barbaca. And then the third player will probably be a winger or be another midfielder or centre-back, i.e. Ibrahim Amadou. So I personally think if we are going to sign any more players, it probably be three more. Um, should we get Klein back in the summer? Personally, for me, because obviously Joe Ward's uh, contract's up, so whether we renew that is another question, but we might not. And obviously, Fossi Mensa goes back to United, so we're unlikely to get him. So really, I think that we could potentially get Klein back because he's still relatively young. He's got good pedigree. He was very good. He's pretty good for Liverpool when he played. And actually, he's still an English international, so he's got that experience there, which obviously would be good. And the fact that he obviously left Palace, it would be nice for him to come back home. And obviously, I'm sure the fans will all welcome him. Oh, South London, should we loan out Papa Soare? Before Jeffrey Slop's injury, I would have said yep. Um, in terms of getting Papa Soare experience and getting him match fitness back up again. But because obviously Papa Soare's um, had this injury and because Jeffrey Slup's now out injured, we can't risk only having one left back at the club. So I don't think that loan uh, deal is going to happen. Um, everyone in the stream got a season ticket. Oh yeah, I can see Danny Boy in the main stand. O South London in the homes they offer. That's great to hear. In terms of your predicted lineup, so O South London... Reckon we'll go 4-4-2, Hennessy, Ward, Tompkins, uh, Kelly, PVA, Townsend, Luca, Reedwald, Zaha, Benteke and Sacco. He also predicts a 1-1 draw. Yep, personally a, a pretty decent lineup. Um, So Danny Boy would go back to a 4 for 3 That's an interesting decision. You know, Roy Hodgson doesn't normally like to play that um, that sort of formation. But he said Hennessy, Tim Fossumensa, Tompkins, Kelly, PVA, uh, MacArthur, Ratip, Rakip. So you're throwing him in the deep end, which is interesting. Um, Luca, Townsend, Benteke and Zoha and you're going for a 2-0 win come on you Palace so really uh, that's that would be so nice to get a clean sheet at London Stadium and a 2-0 win and I think that I personally don't think we'll throw Rakip in the deep end we'll probably be on the bench but I certainly do agree with, in terms of having for Luca in the midfield with Benteke, Zaha up top I think that could potentially work for us Am I surprised by another Amadou bid? I am slightly surprised in terms of we've brought in uh, Yak, so we don't really need a centre-back. But in terms of just giving us a little bit more cover, that's great because there's a few players out of contract. And I think the fact that um, Amadou can play left-back, he can play centre-back, he can play defence in midfield. I think that the fact that we've got someone who's versatile, who can play not only in defence but in midfield as well. And the fact, sorry, and the fact that we're looking at other players as well. Uh, someone like Rakip as well who can play anywhere in the midfield. The fact that we're buying players who are uh, who are young, got quality and obviously are quite adaptable and they can change positions is obviously great. So I, although I'm surprised at Amadou, I still do see the reasons behind it because obviously the quality he have. Um, I've seen obviously you guys um, sharing my feed on Twitter. I do thank you for that. And when the video does go out, please also do share that as well. So obviously I can get views on that. Um, the window shot. So I know Danny Boy asked this, but it does shot. 11 p.m. on Wednesday, so I'll probably be doing a stream mostly over the evening up until probably about 11 o'clock, just going over the transfer window as a whole. And if there are any deadline day signings, I'll bring them to you if and when they do happen. Oh, South London, do I think Roy Hodgson is happy with our current transfer dealings? Personally, for me, I think yes, because he's got a centre back in, so that's what he wanted. He wanted a bit of cover. Now we've got Sacco back, we've got four centre backs, which is, you know, back to a bit of depth. And obviously he wanted a bit more midfield cover with the injury to, to Kabai, Loftus-Cheek and Jason Punchin. So Rakip has done that. So I think he'd be happy in terms of that. But he won't be happy in terms of the fact that we haven't got a striker yet. And also the fact that we're still waiting uh, for a new goalkeeper. Obviously a few bit of information here from South, oh, South London. Getafe will only receive a million from the clause because Valencia owed 20% according to newspaper. Yes, I've heard that as well. So I think that the reason Getafe want Palace to play the 8 million buyout clause instead of the 4 million is purely because they will receive more money because of obviously Valencia having such a big yeah having such a, a big percentage of that do I think Spironi will retire at the end of the season personally for me I think no because if you listen to his interview with five year plan a few months back he said that when he's going to only retire when he feels that he's not up for it anymore when he when he's not happy playing football anymore and when he feels that he had damaged his reputation so for me I think as long as Spironi's happy, I think just keep giving him one-year contracts because as a third-choice goalkeeper, you know, if we get, let's say, Guaita and we keep Hennessy as a third-choice goalkeeper, 
I don't actually think that Spironi is that bad. And in terms of his experience and his sort of reputation in the training ground, I think having that sort of influence there uh, would obviously be great. Um, Kai Kai's out of contract, so won't come back. That's true, he's out of contract, but I think that if he does well at Cholton, Palace will probably give him a one-year extension like they did with Johnny Williams, just to keep him at the club even more. Um, through, so, Osavalon is hoping for free signings. Um, all pretty good suggestions there. Um, personally, for me, I haven't seen Palace being linked with them, so I can't really, really comment on them too much, but uh, good suggestions there. Uh, and just going back sort of to the beginning of the stream, Danny Boy saying numbers don't really matter to him, so that's obviously in relation to the new signings numbers. So obviously Rakip with the new 31 and obviously Yak with 33. So obviously you don't really care too much, but I just thought I'd inform you as you obviously asked in the last stream um, about the numbers. Obviously, you know, just going back to Getafe, I personally think, you know, he'll be a great keeper to bring in. And hopefully, you know, in terms of if we are going to bring in a player on deadline day, he'll be a marquee signing. I think for me, it will be um, Gaitan. So just looking back, obviously going back to the recent comments, any truth in Balassi wanting to leave? Personally for me, I've, I've heard uh, you know, and seen on Twitter that he looks unhappy at Everton and obviously the fans are getting quite frustrated with him because obviously he's not bringing the quality that they would have liked. So I, I personally for me, I can see that there's a bit of discontent there. So um, yeah, I think there's a little bit of truth in it. Not too much, but I think there's something in it, uh, a little bit too much, a little bit in there. Would Lee Griffiths be a shout, uh, be worth a shot? Personally, for me, I think, you know, once again, Lee Griffiths, yes, he's a good player in the Scottish League. Whether he can do that in the Premier League is another question. And for me, personally, I don't think he'd be up to the standard. But I do think that someone like Moussa Dembele, who's played in the Championship and was linked to Premier League clubs at that time, he could be someone, potentially, who would be much better suited than Lee Griffiths. And I think Lee Griffiths is also... Uh, slightly older so it'll be better getting Dembele because he's younger is 7 million too much for Guaita uh, personally for me no if you've got a player in their prime so we've got Guaita who's 31 years old he's in his prime so actually 7 million to bring him uh, four months early I don't see anything wrong with that I think if he's got the quality it's good and we def we obviously desperately need a keeper because Hennessy and Speroni are inconsistent so I don't think 7 million uh, is too much do you reckon we'll go after a phobie from Bournemouth we were actually linked with a phobie when he moved to Bournemouth. And I've seen a few links linking us to him this transfer window, but I don't really see that happening. Um, Danny Boy said, you'd think to, uh, you'd like to think that with the departure of Kaiko, we'd be confident of arrivals. Yeah, because obviously Kaiko is in the 25-man squad, so we've obviously lost the player from the 25-man squad. So obviously to fill up the 25 spaces, we've got to bring in more players. So obviously Steve Parrish and co are quite confident in terms of bringing more players in. Should we send Ruben Loftus Cheek back to Chelsea? Personally, for me, I think that you know, if Loftus Cheek has surgery, then possibly. But if Loftus Cheek doesn't have surgery, then he obviously will be back in a few weeks and he'll still be able to play this season. So I don't see any reason why we shouldn't send him back. And also, there is a clause in the contract or, or in the loan contract that if he plays a certain amount of games, he doesn't, he can't get recalled back by Chelsea so unless we come to an agreement where we pay or I think Chelsea pay or Palace play um, I don't think there's any reason why he should go back and the fact that Roy Hodgson said he wants him to stay obviously proves that it's probably not going to happen. Mitrovic, Mitrovic from Newcastle is another option yep I think Mitrovic could bring another sort of dimension to our attack and he's a slightly different option to Benteke but the fact that he's been out of the Newcastle team for so long now I think it may have sort of slightly affected him and maybe he not, might not be up to the standard he was before. So for me, if we are going to get a striker, it will be Dembele or Barbakov for me. But, you know, if we are, aren't able to get either of them, then I don't see why Mitrovic couldn't be with, a, be with a shout. But the fact that Rafa Benitez said he's not likely to leave to Brighton, I don't think he'll leave to Palace either.
So like I said, do comment, keep do keep your comments coming, obviously with your suggestions. And also, if you haven't subscribed already, or you've got friends who haven't subscribed, do get them along to the channel. Do subscribe because obviously I'm trying to hit 700 subscribers, and I'm very close now. So it'd be great to obviously hit that milestone. And obviously, with the help of you lot, that would be much appreciated. So yeah, I've just seen your comments, but before I go through and obviously read them, I found the video that the club posted the other day in terms of the training video. So if you were listening on to earlier on in the in the live stream, I was discussing obviously about the training and about how our new signings have performed. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to show you that video um, of the training, just to give you an idea of the quality that not only, um, you know, that Yak brings to the side defensively, but also the qualities that Rakip has um, going forward and actually... Just have a look to see whether you do think he'll fit into the Palace system because based on what I've seen in terms of his pressure and in terms of his movement, I think that he'd be quite quite, quite a good sort of impact player if he doesn't settle into the Premier League right away. So here's the video now. So there you have it, that was just a small video obviously that the club put out on their uh, official media accounts on their, and on their website eagles.cpc.co.uk and that obviously just give you an idea of obviously what they do on the training ground but obviously you know they were keeping an eye out on the new signings and actually they did look quite quality so do comment below 
what you think, obviously what you've gathered from that video, and whether you do think the players will be a success in the Premier League this season. So just looking at the stream now, just looking at obviously a few of your comments. You're talking obviously about Steve Parrish and Roy Hodgson, their ages. So if you want, I'll just look up on Wikipedia, obviously looking up their ages just to obviously give you a more accurate uh, reading, obviously because quite a lot, obviously some of you want to know. So I might as well give you exactly their birthday. Quite interesting to hear your views. Uh, no sound, yeah, the sound should be working, I believe. Just looking at the software, yeah, the sound should be there. I think there was just a little bit of a pause. Maybe there was a glitch or something. So as you can see on the screen now, obviously that's Roy Hodgson's age, so he's 70 years old, so I think one of you said that in the comment section, so obviously you got it right. Obviously his birthday was in August, so he's not necessarily uh, nearing uh, 71, but he's still in his 70s, obviously the oldest ma oldest manager in the Premier League. Obviously just a bit of information here uh, about Roy Hodgson himself, obviously, obviously the fact that he was born on the 9th of August uh, 1947, obviously being 70 years old and obviously born in Croydon so you know a bit of a bit more information there about Roy Hodgson and in terms of Steve Parrish um, there's no age here but if you're good at maths you can work this out but it's a bit late for me so I'm not gonna work this out but he was born in 1965 um, so if you want to work that out for yourself go ahead and do because I'm just not in the mood for maths at the minute but like you say there obviously he's not necessarily as famous as Roy Hodgson but there's a little bit of information there in terms of in 2016 his net worth was 45 uh, million pounds obviously he owns a few businesses and obviously he's the part owner and chairman of palace obviously as you already know so just a bit of information there about both Roy Hodgson and Steve Parrish obviously just to you know inform you guys obviously as you were having discussions about it in the comment section so like I've said do keep these comments coming they're quite interesting to read through and obviously hear your guys opinion Yep, so Earth Changing has said Parrish will be 53 this year, so thank you for working that out, obviously. I am not, I'm, I'm, can't be bothered to do my maths uh, this late of, at night, but uh, there you go, a bit of information for you there. So just looking looking back at the comments, obviously, uh, Danny Boys just said, Roy done well at a similar size club as Palace, like Fulham, West Brom. I totally agree with that. I think that Roy Hodgson, Nottingham Forest, I believe as well, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was there as well. I think that Roy Hodgson, you know, people just look at England, but if you look back at his managerial career, he's done absolutely fantastic, whether that be at Fulham, West Brom, obviously Palace now. And obviously the pressure of England got to him and obviously we lost to Iceland. But if you look back at the the campaign before that in terms of, you know, all the games leading up to it, so the qualifiers, he done fantastic in the qualifiers. And well, yes, we lost to Iceland, which is an embarrassment. He still, you, you've got to put blame on the manager, but also I think it's mainly the players as well obviously Danny Boy also adding on he was out of debt for Liverpool completely and I think that 
think the fact that Liverpool had another manager who was close to coming through the door obviously didn't help. Um, Earth Changing has said Parrish looks 10 years younger. Uh, yeah, for me, obviously, I'm, I wasn't aware of his age before we've had this conversation now. I personally think he was a lot younger than he was. All that Botox, possibly, obviously, because he's got all that money, maybe it was um, Botox. You, uh, Danny Boy said he doesn't think that Roy has another year in him. He's 70. Uh, yep, personally, yep, he could. I, I personally could see him leaving in the summer, obviously retiring, hopefully keeping Palace up and leave end his career on a high. Or I personally could see maybe him staying on for the rest, rest of his contract, which is obviously, I believe it was a two and a half year contract. So he's got another two seasons with Palace. I think that he could still uh, do a job for us in terms of, you know, building the club up. And it would be nice for him to leave his, uh, end his career on a high. Do I think Dean Kiley is a good acquisition as the goalkeeping coach? Totally. I think that, you know, obviously uh, Martin Marcuson went off to Everton and obviously he was good when he first came in. But the fact that, you know, we started to see stuff creep in of old when um, Sam Allardyce left, maybe obviously something happened and maybe because Sam Allardyce wasn't there, obviously the goalkeepers went downhill. But Dean Carey, obviously, I'm not, I'm not going to say too much yet as to whether he's had an impact but certainly I think that based on the training videos I've seen and based on some of the things that Hennessy is doing now that he hasn't done before in terms of let's say catches it's obviously great to see that he's now tr starting to do them so obviously um, you know he's doing a good job there. Do, what do I think of Stephen Reed as an assistant coach? I was actually talking about this with a Chelsea fan, a friend of mine and he was saying that actually in terms of Palace's turnaround yes Roy Hodgson uh, was quite important along with the rest of the backroom uh, team but actually Stephen Reid was actually quite important as well and I think that the fact that he's young and he's obviously just recently done his coaching thing and he's learning as he's going on he's learning from Roy I actually think that Stephen Reid is a good coach based on what we've seen you know he's good defensively he knows what he needs to do but the fact that he's learning from someone like Roy Hodgson is obviously great um, another one here from O South London a question do you think the West Ham game is an unneeded distraction in terms of the transfer window, it is because we're going to have to play a game. Then a few hours later, it's the nearing the end of the transfer window. So obviously, it's going to put a, a bit of pressure on us in terms of Roy Hodgson can't be there to discuss players or contracts along with Steve Parrish and Doggy Freeman because he'll obviously be managing at the game. And yes, I think it's a uh, an unwanted, unneeded, unwanted distraction. But I personally think the fact that it was on, we played a game on deadline day last year, I think we can cope with that um, quite well. Um, Jordan Much, yep, Jordan Much, I believe, has got 18 months left in his contract. You know, you know, thank you know, Pardew, he left his gift, uh, leaving Jordan Much on a massive long contract. But I personally think Jordan Much will be one of these players who could potentially leave, along with Lee Chun Yong, could potentially leave uh, in the window now. Should we get another goalkeeper if Guaita doesn't join this window? Personally, for me, yep, because obviously we're guaranteed to get Guaita. A, in the summer obviously with him joining on a free transfer but I think we now we need someone now whether that be a short-term thing or also a long-term thing much like Guaita I think we actually need someone to come in now not because Hennessy and Sproni are bad purely because they're quite inconsistent so it'd be good to have someone there and just looking at your last sort of few comments here um, may use Friedman links um, Scottish connection to get Griffiths talking again yeah I think Griffiths Griffiths is a good player in the prem in the Scottish division, don't know whether it'd be good enough in the Premier League, but we could say the same about Moussa Dembele. I've uh, got another comment here saying that Moussa Dembele is a very lazy, lazy player. He could, um, he wouldn't add anything over Benteke. Lee Griffiths has already shown the quality against England. He's his second fiddle, but he's also cheaper. Yes, I, I, I agree with the fact that he's cheaper and the fact that he obviously destroyed England. But I still do think that actually Moussa Dembele, yes, people have called him lazy, but if you look at his overall game, on his day, he could be fantastic. And the fact, the fact that he's got a little bit more pace and a little bit more uh, agility, let's say, in comparison to Benteke, I think as a partnership, they will work really well. So although Moussa Dembele will be really expensive, the fact that he's much younger than Griffiths, I think will be much better, a much better option for us. And in terms of Lee Chun Yong, will he make the 25-man squad? I personally think he will. I think that unlike Jordan Much, who is more likely to get sold, I think that Chungi... We'll, we'll leave in the summer because I think his contract's up. But I also think that actually um, we're just keeping him purely because there's actually no one really interested in buying him. Um, do I 
reckon would consider Danny Ings if Barbaco Dembele ha doesn't happen? I think, yep, on a deadline day, we could do like a... We could rush the signing and get Danny Ings. Yes, obviously, it'll be sort of a panic buy, but I still think that Danny Ings has got a bit of quality left uh, left in him. Obviously, he's had his injuries, but he's he's on the road to recovery now. So, I think he'll also be uh, quite a good signing. Uh, Elliot Davidson saying Roy was good at Malmo. Yes, he's very good at Malmo. And that's one of the reasons why Eda Rakip joined Paris, because he obviously knew how good of a manager um, Roy Hodgson was, because he's a legend at Malmo. Benicophobia, yeah, we discussed about this earlier on, um, earlier on in the uh, in the live stream. Benicophobia could be an option for Palace. I personally would prefer Dembele uh, or Barbaca, but I think that Benicophobia could be one that potentially Bournemouth are looking to get rid of. But I personally don't think he really fits our system, so I don't really see that one happening. Uh, Earth Changing says Parrish sold his previous business for 100 million. Yep, I think his business tag he t he sold for 100 million to concentrate on Paris. But it came out the other day that um, that he's invested in a new business, which also Glenn Murray's invested in. But I think that's like a chicken uh, catering business or whatever it is. So I think yes, he sold his business, but he's now invested in another one. Uh, you said you think yeah, but I, I also do think as well. Was Frank de Boer appointment Paris's biggest mistake? Uh, definitely. Obviously, all chairmen make mistakes and everyone makes uh, mistakes. But I still do think that, um, yeah, I still do think that Paris done done it in the best of interest. So he wanted to change our system. He didn't want us to be battle, battling relegation. So I totally understand why he uh, bought Frank de Boer in. But obviously, it didn't work for numerous reasons, whether it was behind the scenes stuff or whether it was just because, you know, it, you know Frank de Boer was too stubborn, whatever it was. It obviously didn't work uh, for us. Callum Wilson would be a great partner for Benteke. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that if we are going to get someone from Bournemouth, let's say, because they've got a surplus of strikers at the minute, I think that Callum Wilson would be perfect because he's got the pace, he's got great headering ability, and in terms of working alongside uh, alongside Benteke, I think he'll work because Benteke is the physical player, good headering ability, whereas Callum Wilson is the more... We've got more agility and he's obviously got the pace to get in behind. So I think that'd be a great partnership. Most improved player under Roy Hodgson for you is Sacco. Yep, South London. Uh, oh, South London, I agree with you. I think that Sacco is the most improved player. But you've also got to look at the likes of Kelly, maybe even Tompkins, you could argue, and Joe Ward as well, because these are the sort of players who also improved. If the transfer window ended now, would I be happy? Um, yes, we're a few players short, but I think overall, I think I would be happy. Obviously, I wouldn't be over the moon in the fact that we didn't sign another striker, but the fact that we brought in, you know, a defender and a midfielder in terms of to replace the injured players, I think that's a good thing. That's what we needed. But now we've addressed them positions. We need to push on in the transfer window and get more players in. Opinions on Benteke's massive head. I think it's um, a great target in terms of, you know, scoring headed goals and we need to get the ball to him more so he can use his head more. How old is Benteke? Um, if you want, I can look that up now. I believe he's 27 years old. So um, if I just look that up now. Yeah, Danny Boy, the stream hasn't ended. Obviously, my software just cut out there, so it wasn't ending. So I'm still here. I'm probably going to end it in, you know, about 10, 15 minutes. So if you do want to get in your questions, uh, then do please uh, please do. Um, oh, South London, do I think it's unfair to label or the media uh, label Zaha as a diver completely? And as Steve Parrish said, I think it's it's a media agenda because if someone like Deli Ali or Sterling does these perceived dives, which are totally... Um, perfect penalties you know there's nothing wrong with them because Zaha has been fouled in the box but if someone like Sterling or yeah let's say Sterling and Deli Alli because they're the best examples if they do it it's all about um you know it's all clever play and it's tricky play but if Zaha does it because he plays for Palace and not Tottenham and Man City respectively because of that he's labelled a diver so much like what Steve Parrish said now he's got a reputation for diving when in reality he doesn't dive and other players get away with stuff which is even worse um, any idea on the transfer budget in terms of what I've read in the media I believe it's around 40 million and the fact that Steve Parrish said that he's on the five-year plan podcast that he's willing to pay a lot of money 
um, in the January transfer window. There's going to be major investment in terms of on the squad and obviously the stadium as well. Obviously suggests that maybe it's 40 million, but maybe it may even be more than that. So we will obviously have to wait and see uh, on deadline day how much money we spend. And obviously if we do go big and buy, you know, Guaitan, we buy Dembele, we buy Barbico, if we and Amadou, if we go out and buy these players, it obviously suggests that actually there's a lot more money than we originally first thought. MacArthur is a sexy beast. Yeah, I do think. I think that actually um, MacArthur is a massively underrated player. And I do think that how important he's been recently, I think he's an absolutely crucial part to the team. Uh, Danny Boy said, who should be, take Palace's next penalty? For me, obviously, Luka Milivojevic missed um, his his last one. But I still think Luka, the fact that he scored all of his other penalties, he's, you know, concreted himself as the first choice penalty taker. Uh, Earth Changing has said that um, Hazard at Chelsea dives all the time and his own supporters are getting tired of this. Uh, Yet yeah, for me, I think Hazard, yes, Hazard doesn't dive as much as, say, uh, Sterling and Deli Alli does, you know, because these players get away with it all the time because they do dive and yet it's worse than Zaha, but yet Zaha dives when it isn't a dive. But whatever, whatever, you, whatever way you look at it, yes, Hazard sometimes dives, i.e. the Arsenal game where they used VAR or they didn't use VAR and gave the penalty. Stuff like that is you know, our dives, but because it's Hazard and because he obviously plays for Chelsea, no one seems to care about it. But I'm sure if Zaha had done that against Arsenal, there'd be massive uproar, purely because it's not the best player in the league. Oh, South London, was Jed Light Palace's best ever captain? Uh, for me, certainly in my time supporting the club, uh, it would have been. He, he is my, probably the best captain. Uh, but... Um, I'm sure that if you go back long enough, there'll be other captains there who have been quite good. And I think that actually someone like Luka Milivojevic or Mamadou Sakho has actually got the ability to be a great captain if they obviously hold on, they stay at the club and we hold on to them and obviously they'll be able to build on their performances. Uh, would I have MacArthur's babies? Uh, that's an interesting question. and That's something that on player Q&As, you normally do get um you normally get questions like that but uh, for me no i wouldn't have MacArthur's babies but you know i do like him as a player but not not that much Are palace a one man team personally for me no if you look at the goal stats uh, for the goals scored this season there hasn't been one player in particular who scored all of the goals so for me yes people could say all oh, zaha is you know makes us a one man team but i still do think there's obviously other quality players in the squad and altogether, I think that we've got, you know, we've got we've got a good squad. So really, for me, I don't really see us uh, as a one-man team. Um, yeah. So do comment below whether you think we're a one-man team. But personally, for me, I don't see us uh, as a one-man team. Does Sproni deserve a statue outside Celeste? I personally think, you know, when we build the new stadium, obviously, or the new stand. There's obviously going to have to be some sort of feature, obviously, to you know, with like with most new developments, you've got some sort of centerpiece, and obviously the stand is going to be the main part of the development. But I still do think some sort of statue, whether that be of Speroni or someone else, I do think that Speroni deserves it, and I think that would be a great addition to have that uh, outside the new the new stand. Best player, best Palace player at FIFA. So are you talking about as in in the game? So when you play FIFA. Who's the best player, or who who as a player is good at playing FIFA? Because for me personally, in terms of the best player to play with, it's got to be Zaha because his striker in form card is absolutely phenomenal. And in terms of an actual player, I think that Wilf is up, up there with one of the best players. But I still think someone like Townsend as well is obviously also good at playing FIFA himself. So do comment below what you think. Danny Boy, would I have Speroni's babies? As much as I, as I love Speroni and I just absolutely idolise him in terms of a Palace legend, I wouldn't have his babies either. So, uh, interesting question, um, but yeah, I'm not going not gonna to have his babies. Would I have Roy's babies? Like I've said with all the other players, as much as I love Roy in terms of the job that he's doing 
at the moment at Palace. If he can keep us up this season and, you know, stay next season and build us even more. If he can do that, I would absolutely adore him. And much like Fulham fans do, I idolise him. But like I said with the other players, I won't have his babies. Oh, South London, is Jack good on FIFA? Personally, for me, I don't know. Obviously, I haven't looked at the stats. But what I can do here, if I look into it now, I think I'll see if I can find his stats. But I don't know if the Polish League is on FIFA for sure. So I can't really say... Um, yeah, I can't really say if he is any good. But I'll just have a look here. See if I can find his rating. So I've just found, I've just typed it into Google. I've got Yak's uh, FIFA card here. So he's a 66 rated centre-back, obviously playing in the Polish League. So hopefully in the next round of updates, which could be in the next week or so, obviously Yak will hopefully get his Palace card. But in terms of his overall card, 70 pace, which is all right for a centre-back. Uh, 45 shooting, which isn't great. 50 passing for a centre-back, which isn't ideal. You'd expect something maybe in the 60s, but obviously passing is not the main thing. Uh, 56 dribbling, you're not going to really expect him to do much dribbling. Uh, 65 defending could be better when you consider he's a 66 rated overall. I think maybe his defending could be better. And the fact that he's got a move to the Premier League will probably upgrade his card automatically anyway. And in terms of physicality, 70 there. I think that's a fair enough thing based on what I've seen in the videos. And like I've said, moving up to the Premier League, he'll probably get uh, an upgrade in that area as well. But just looking at other stats as well. So overall... I think, yeah, a beast rating 81. So I think overall, you know, he's got good enough stats here. You know, looking at speed, acceleration, positioning, all of these stuff um, are pretty decent. And in terms of defending, all of them are in the yellow, which is just, he's quite an overall rounded card on FIFA. So overall, I think he's a, a pretty decent card on FIFA. So if you do want to buy him, whether that be on career mode or for your team, I don't see any reason uh, why you couldn't get him. So we've got another question here, is Rakip any good on FIFA? So I'm looking at his stats as well, and his card is slightly better um, than Yak's card. So I'm just going to bring it up on the screen here. So just looking at his card here, uh, a 68 rated centre mid with uh, 68 pace, 53 shooting, 64 passing, 71 dribbling, 52 defending and 73 physical. So it's overall quite a good rounded card. But I've looked at the updates and I think his Palace card has been upgraded to a 70 rated. So that would put him up there, I think, level with Loftus-Cheek. So I think that actually, if you are looking to get a cheap sort of silver team, I think that Rakip could be a good option. Because obviously with him getting a 2 upgrade, he could potentially be having looking at having about 70 pace. Maybe an upgrade in shooting to around the 60, uh, depending on how generous FIFA are when you consider he scored 8 goals this season. 64 passing maybe that could get upgraded to about 66 dribbling maybe you know two or three upgrade on that defending i don't think he does much defending so i can't really rate him on that and maybe because he's moving to the premier league a, a slight upgrade on his physicality there in terms of his overall stats there's a few reds there so it's not really ideal but like i've said in the premier league you're going to get a slight upgrade and he's already been moved to a 70 rated so hopefully when they release all of the cards and all of the stats hopefully he'll get uh, an overall improvement there so yep do comment below whether you uh, would consider buying him, buying him for your FIFA team Is Steve Barrett the chairman? No, I don't think uh, Steve Barrett is the chairman. Obviously, Steve Parrish is the chairman, but I still think he's on the board, and obviously, he's one of the owners. So, although he isn't necessarily directly involved, I, do, I still do think that he's, you know, he's still got an influence there, but he's not as high up 
let's say in the hierarchy as Steve Parrish is. Um, Rakip's got bad shooting, yes he has, but hopefully, hopefully if he can score a few goals and if he gets an upgrade uh, for obviously the goal or obviously for the goals he scored this season, hopefully his shooting will be increased. What's Wilf Sun Sun called? I think his name is Leo Leon. So do correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Wilf Sun is called Leo. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to end the stream here now with a few of your predictions. So o, o South London has said 2-0 to Palace for his West Ham prediction. I've seen other people say 1-1 draw. So do comment below with your predictions. But for me, I never do really like to make predictions, obviously, because they can backfire. Um, but I do think that, you know, it'll be quite a good game. I think that West Ham may be slightly tired. But I do, I do still think that we've got the quality to match West Ham. And I think that with the injuries they have got to Lanzini and Anatovic, I think we might have a chance there. So I'm not going to make a prediction, but I do think that we've got a good chance there. Why do I keep annoying your questions? You should listen to your voice more often. Um, prick. Okay, you want to call me Prick, that's fine. But, you know, I've got quite a lot of questions coming through. If I've missed your questions, I do uh, apologise. But some of them, obviously, are quite inappropriate. So, obviously, I can't uh, accept all of them, but... You know, if, if you want me to answer your questions, then maybe have more suitable ones. Do I think the guy to deal is an ideal signing because he's quite old? Well, for a goalkeeper, actually, um, he's actually quite young for a goalkeeper because he's 31 years old. He's hitting his peak. And most goalkeepers, look at Speroni, can go to their about 38 years old. So actually, Guaita, in his prime at the minute, I think that actually he'd be a good signing. Do I think we're signing Gavin uh, Englefield? Is he the guy from League One? I'm not sure. Um, do comment below whether he is that guy, but I don't know. I haven't seen much about him, so I don't know whether he, we will sign him. And in terms of earth changing, just to end um, the live stream here, great YouTube blog. Uh, you know, you know. Once again, thanks for the um, you know, thanks for the support on the live stream. And in a few, you know. In about an hour's time, maybe even tomorrow morning, the full live stream should be out. So if you want to look back at, obviously, what I've discussed, then, of course, do feel free to do so. So once again, uh, thanks for watching and thanks for tuning in and thanks for your comments. And if you don't mind subscribing, that would be a great help to me. And hopefully in the next few weeks or in the next few days, we'll make a few more signings. And like I've said to a few people in the comments section, when we do make a signing, I'll be doing a live stream that night. So do keep your eyes peeled when we make a new signing for when my live stream uh, live streams will be coming out so uh, once again thanks for watching and remember to come back when we make a new signing but all i've got to say now is remember to up the palace